introduce myself uh, for uh, the new members of the audience. I'm Andrés Kovács, and I'm from uh, from from the Hungarian Research Network. And uh, I'll be chairing these sessions called Users and Application Virtual uh, Learning. The first uh, presenter is Javier Carreras from Barcelona, from uh, Grand Theatre of uh, uh, the Liceu, which is uh, the opera house in Barcelona. And they are dealing with uh, broadcasting op operas uh, through the internet in high quality uh, for, uh, for educational purposes. So, Javier, please. Hello. Uh, I apologize in advance for my, my English, but I try to do my best. Okay. Mm. Barcelona Opera House opened in, in 1856 and was rebuilt in, in 1999. In new Liceo equipment uh, with the last test audiovisual technology, a connection uh, to the main networks was a goal. Nowadays, Liceo is working towards fully developing its technological possibilities of fulfilling one of its main objectives to search for new ways and means of bring opera closer to the people, especially the youngest ones, and to create a new audiences. Opera Oberta, it's an, it's an example of this purpose, uh, but other initiatives like Canella Cultural or live broadcasting to locations in Spanish cinemas are also supporting these works. Uh, Opera Oberta uh, was born from the aim to unite the art and technology, providing an educational background to the university community. The project is based on a free choice uh, university option that would, uh, that would logically have a course value for the students uh, and would include uh, within a series of opera broadcasts live from Liceu, attending a, confer a conference for each opera, attending an introductionary class for each opera, an internet portal which complementary content, uh, and a sitting a final ex assessment exam. Uh, students must uh, then do this exam for guarantee the, the objectives of the course. Uh, projects, project results to date have been highly satisfactory from the academic point of view. In addition, however, outcomes that were initially uh, unexpected are being achieved. One of these is the existence of a virtual community which has established itself around the course. The first course to be offered in, a, in, a, in identical form simultaneously in almost 50 universities in different countries around the world. Uh, I want to thank uh, the work and support of the research and educational networks. Without uh, his, uh, because our project without her help was impossible, not be possible. Anella Scientifica, Retiris, Jean, Alice, Clara, Rapp, and FSCCN. Uh, as a present above, Opera Oberta, Opera Oberta broadcast consists of two types of media content preliminary seminars and live opera broadcasts. With the technical audiovisual resources in the Liceo Opera Hall, the production team fits the, fits the unnecessary signals to the encoder to generate the service to be transmitted. For the previous seminar, SDI video and different digital audios, one for each language, official language in the course, there are five languages, and for the live opera, SD, SDI video, Dolby Digital, and live subtitling from the live event performed on the stage of the Liceo. The signals are multiplexed into a mainstream that is transmitted under the European Video Distribution Standard, DDB. This standard enables resources to be optimized, increasing the performance of the service needed, and synchronizing all the media data streams, audio, video, and, and subtitles. Multicast is the transport protocol used to, to provide this service to the universities and at reception, uh, minimum, minimum, PC, minimum characteristic PC with the necessary official decoding software 
like DLC the, from Videoland, generate, regenerate all the signals to be presented in the university auditoriums. It's necessary to add to this that uh, to maintain the rights adhered for the productions to be broadcasted and for compliance with legal obligations, it's, it's essential to encrypt the transmitted signal. We use a ZipperCast solution for, for this purpose. Therefore, the reception PC needs a physical part of the encryption process, the smart card that Opera Oberta provides to the university that takes of the part in the project. Uh, here we can see the, in more detail the coding and adaptation of the information to be broadcasted. Thomson MPEG-2 encoder multiplex all signals uh, coded video, audio, and subtitles were are delivered on the output into one program, the Opera Oberta transport stream, the main stream. Uh, and Avia packetizes the information to travel over IP, but not before being encrypted. Then the packets go through the Liceo router. Two groups are multicasted, one main stream with Opera Oberta transport stream and the other for the encrypted information. For this one, for the encrypted information, um, virtual private and multicast network techniques are used, based on the creation of a virtual private network at each end, thereby allowing the destination university's firewalls to be crossed without any problem. All Opera Oberta broadcasts are recorded using an EVIA VOD solution that connects the multicast group and record the transport stream. This is used to do some uh, subsequent broadcasts at a later date. Let's go and explain how that is encapsulated for these transmissions. One elementary stream is one continuous stream that contains one kind of data, such as video, audio, or data. Subtitles in our project are trade of like data. This information is divided into program elementary streams, uh, which are tagged with a packet ID, which indicate to which elementary stream packet belongs. Elementary stream is not packet, it's a continuous stream, sorry. One program has a set of association of PIDs, PIDs, and each program is tagged with a program number. It's also a PID. Multiple services, multiple services or programs could be broadcasted on the same transmission channel, producing a transport stream. In Opera Oberta, only one program is delivered. The MPEG-2 system standards defines this method of multiplexing data for a set of elementary streams into one serial bit stream that is packetized in 188 uh, bytes to be delivered over IP. The UDP IP is the standard used to map this transport stream in the transmission layer. Uh, RT, RTP, uh, no, RTP is being uh, tested, but it increases the decoding process and for the moment is not established in our end-to-end -end definite scenario. Once the DBB stream arrives at the decoder, the standard has the signaling tables to identify the required PID to the multiplex information needed. A program association table that contains a well-known PID, always with a zero value, lists all programs in the multiplex. Then the decoder gets the program identifiers this transport stream and thanks to this information can get the program map table, which contains the PIDs of each elementary stream of the program to the OSER had selected. Now let's go at the Opera Oberta transport stream more closely. This is the actual Opera Oberta service being transmitted. You can see seven elementary streams, video, audios, one for each official language, uh, and one for the Dolby Digital. And the result and bit rate actual is 10 megabytes. This is uh, the, the act, this course we do with this, with it, transmissions with, with these elementary streams. And today I come to explain how will be next course. Uh, <coughs> MPEG-4 has a lot of functionalities and properties, but for Opera Oberta, the use is only concerted with a video compression. Here we're talking about the video stream, the transport of the MPEG-4 elementary stream over MPEG-2 system. The MPEG-2 system is designed mainly for broadcast type application and it's used for most dig digital TV standards, specific worldwide like DVB, Europe's, America's ATSC or Japanese ARIB standard. 
MPEG-4 compression is demonstrated as being more efficient than MPEG-2 video coding as well as we see in the next slide. And do that, an amendment was introduced by the MPEG-2 desync team. So MPEG-4 data could be easily embedded in the worldwide standards used at the moment, the MPEG-2 infrastructure. The, the new stream type defined in the, in the program map table of the service identifies the MPEG-4 compressed video or audio stream. Uh, the decoding and presentation times in the header of the MPEG-4 stream are expressed in, the, in respect to the MPEG-2 system timeline. This is the synchronization of the video and audio and data of the same stream or the same service. Anyway, the transport of our MPEG-2 system of isolated MPEG-4 elementary stream do not rely on MPEG-4 system functionality like interactive. Buttons or objects can be moved on the image, but for this purpose, for our needs, MPEG-4 coding solves our, our main problem, bandwidth and quality of experience decreasing that the higher bit rate causes. Discontinuities in the decoding results in video freezing and artifacts, audio codes, or video lamp program sometimes is hanging about these problems, bandwidth and, bandwidth and quality of experience. Let's concentrate now in the MPEG-4 part 10 video layer coding, also called ACT-264 APC. The main goals of this standard have been enhanced compression, performance, and the robustness to data errors and losses in transmission. In our case, the uses is for real-time non-conversional video streaming. Then H264 solves some problems in our application, like reduction in recorded bandwidth or video artifacts and audio cuts introduced by data loss. Here I comment some highly highlighted features of the, of the H.264 codec in respect to MPEG-2 video codec. Uh, but first, we must understand which techniques are used to encode a video. This is a little general approximation. Like in previous video coding standards, each picture is divided into blocks and luma and chroma information and them are scanned. Discrete cosine transform uh, and quantification is applied to each block. Macro blocks consist of sequence of blocks and slices, and slices of macro blocks. Uh, then pictures are sequences of, of these macro blocks or slices, these slices. This is an intracoding technique, uh, which only is applied to the current frame. But then appears the interframe compression using temporal redundancy between frames. A frame is an only intra technique, and B and P frame uses interframe prediction. That is to say, the encoder needs information of previous or next images to reconstruct the current image. Motion compensation comes about combining these techniques using buffering properties. I neglected to comment on the entropy coding methods that is applied to the quantific transfer coefficients, reducing information redu redundancy and DCT coefficient quantifications. H264 introduced more flexibility in block size which is multiple reference slides, not only iframes for motion compensation and quarter sample accuracy. Reduces video artifacts taking a small block size transform and the encoder choose the ordering of pictures for referencing and display purposes, constrained only by a total memory capacity imposed on the decoder. Advanced entropy coding methods like context adaptive variable length coding or context adaptive binary arithmetic coding are introduced in H264 syntax. Of all of these features are not contemplated in MPEG-2 video coding, and due to this, H264 had moved previous video codecs out of market. But the MPEG-4 standard introduces some problems for the implementation, for our implementation, because compression algorithms require more processing in the coding and specific decoding processes but this is solved with the upgrades in the decoder tool. Here is the new encoder uh, introduced at SURF at the Liceu. Thompson Vive gives us a best option. The difference with the old scenario is that subtitles are fit now by ASCII interface, not by IP. Subtitling is most difficult part to provide. It's not usual in commercial scenarios stream five simultaneous subtitles streams uh, using DVD map formats. We have worked with Thompson, Cabena, and Videoland technicians to provide this feature. In this scenario, we have designed two modes for obtaining a streamed service backup, 
the VOD and a VIA system that we are using now too, that capture transport stream and the Cabena text plus time code. Uh, this last mode at the end of the transmission give us the subtitle text with a time code that was sent. Then uh, we can have the recorded file tape and with this file we can do a deferred emissions. Next elementary stream uh, in a standard, de standard definition. Yes, in a standard definition. Here, here we can see the change from the transport stream generated since the project started is the video encoding standard. Another new feature is the ability to introduce more subtitle streams, for example, English, that is not an official language, science now, and Italian or, or other. This diagram shows what is the final settings for the Opera Oberta encoding part will be. Now, HD, HD, HDI, HD, HDI signal fit the full coding infrastructure and um, by downsampling video signals, we fit the SD encoder. This option is to give a low bit rate transport stream to universities with bandwidth problems. Now we have an H.264 high definition service with HD DVD bitmap subtitles and a SD service with a standard definition, only with a stereo and subtitles in vision, incrusted in the, Im in the image. And EVIA is working on solution for ACD ABC recordings. In the new scenario, only MPEG-4 video coding will be used. Therefore, it's important to decide which profile we will use. A profile defines how complex is the decoding is and the settings of the syntax for the generated bit stream. And in the other hand, level defines the set of constraints of the values which may be taken by the parameters of the particular profile, for example, resolution. Uh, another new characteristic of the Opera Oberta and ANSET uh, service will be the subtitles, as already mentioned. And here we can see the bit rates that it's, um, I think, the, the more relevant uh, thing. Until now, universities work with this uh, structure. And once multicast is properly enabled on the local network, a decoding PC with a VLC, uh, and the specific decryption software provide is needed to play audiovisual content. For new universities added to the project, commonly multicast reception is the most difficult step to solve. But once it is solved, the receiving Opera Oberta project mainstream is really easy. About the presentation, the usual connection is by VHGI to, to fit a projector for the video and SPDAE for Dolby Digital Audio. If the university doesn't have Dolby encoder, decoder, this is not a problem because VideoLand provides a stereo mix down too. Different facts could affect to the quality of the experience for the end users, the students. The main sort of transmission errors due to packet loss range for horizontal video artifacts or picture freezing when it is more critical. Of course, its audio is also affected by this packet loss. But now, with the new source devices and the technologies advanced, the reception scenario is getting more effective. Let's have a look. Uh, in our test with a standard definition in MPEG-4, end users give very positive feedback after checking the, this new codec Opera Oberta service. Anyway, some implantation issues must be overcome. 10 months ago, VideoLAN player was not able to decode ABC video codec because MPEG-4 is not compatible with the prior codec standard. Uh, now MPEG-4 codec for a standard definition video works correctly, but anyway with, anyway, with high definition, it is still not stable enough, the VLC. Another fact concerns the connection. Opera Oberta will show the universities different options for how to connect the decoding unit to the presentation devices, because from Liceo we act as consultants to the universities. In any case, uh, the, present, the presentation is a backward compatibility, as is happening on TV screens in consumers' home. If the high television definition content is screened on a standard definition device, users will have a better experience. More information brings better quality for the same presentation resolution. If the university invests in a new, in a new high definition projector, of course, the quality of the broadcast line will be kept and the quality of experience increases. 
The implementation of the new codec in Opera Alberta transmissions will be effective during the next course year. We invite uh, interested universities to participate in new codec and resolution test sessions because in spite of having to check the stability of the new codec in a standard definition, there are some issues to achieve, to achieve a similar desirable HD decoding stability. Therefore, Opera Alberta will define two kinds of receptors, official and working group along next course. With the second group, we will work to increase the resolutions, image of subtitle bitmaps, new audio compression standards, possibilities of VOD in our project, and, and what coming. Another way, we are investiga investigating the possibility of changing receptors from a PC to a dedicated device, like a set-top box. This will avoid a lot of technical support to the universities and provide the easiest reception configuration. Perhaps a user interface, like I imagine in my slide, could be possible. Once audiovisual reception is set, support of connections could be assured by specific tools. The Beacon gives us an interesting way to check to solve this issue for multicast. Now, I, I have generated some test files to, to give you this information in image and in content. Well, okay. uh, this is the, the decoder PC and the VLC. As you can see, we have four languages, official languages. We can select uh, which, which one in the, in the university and audio too. Then this is a contents in, in SD. This is MPEG-2 codec with the subtitles in DVB bitmap. We can select... Oof. Here we can see we have add a new language in English. I want to to recommend to you to give some details of image and when I put the MPEG-4 at the contents, you could check between two. I take some advance. In ACD, I hope it's listening better. <laughs> it's important to see the, the image in the, the dark zones to, com to check or compare it with the ACD contents. I can take more. And now, now I put the contents.
uh, we only can see the images. Uh, here, this is ACD content, but not in the high profile and high level, because uh, DLC at the moment can decode it. I think FFmpeg is working on it. Uh, I wish I can take the part and the audio and have a little, but it's not possible, sorry. Thank you very much. I think it's, it's a very valuable initiative, very professional and, and, and broadcast oriented. Um, questions? Questions? Thank you. Hello, Xavi. Um, Hello. Uh, I understood that uh, MP4 have a, a lot of benefit. What do you think, what is the main problem to implement it? Cost, experience, I don't know, because I don't see a lot of uh, projects involving in MP4. What's the reason? Now? The main problem of the MPEG-4 implantation in the project? Yes. I think what the problem I have, one, it's in the coding part, because VLC gives us some problems to decode MPEG-4. And another, it's the integration of each, each hardware in the emission, in the emission, like subtitling, that it's DVD bitmap, and normally broadcasters like TV or, or other don't use this, this format. This is a problem, but the main problem, I think, is in the coder, and we are still working on it. Uh, in my opinion, so uh, compared to M MPEG-2, you can uh, do the same quality at half bandwidth, and, and that would be a reason uh, when you would like to store the recordings. So that, that, that is one thing. Other questions? Uh, just a remark. <clears throat> I'm Simon Leinen from Switch. I used to participate in uh, a few of the Opera Alberta transmissions. Also, the uh, Philadelphia Orchestra last year, they uh, did some trials with similar uh, transmissions to auditoriums. Unfortunately, they stopped doing that. Uh, I, I think they ran out of funding or something. They, uh, by the way, they used the Amino uh, set-top boxes, which uh, had a very nice performance. I think they used MPEG-2 at uh, full H 1080i. Uh, unless I'm mistaken. I think it was MPEG-2. I just uh, scanned my archive. They weren't talking about, um, about MPEG-4. I think it was MPEG-2 MPEG at around 25 megabits per second. I, 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 personally, I think um, thinking about uh, a 50% bandwidth um, savings is misplaced uh, economy here because if you, can, if you can handle 10 megabits, you can handle 20 megabits in our context, in this context of your application. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, the, the Philadelphia Orchestra uh, stuff, they, uh, comparing both approaches, I think they worked much less professionally than you guys do because they had less experience with the testing and still the performance was, uh, was very nice. It is uh, orchestra concerts, it's a different feeling it feels more life because it's less rehearsed than opera, but and the the quality is uh, really very good. Very good in the in in both systems. The mm -hmm. but the higher resolution is uh, gives it something something extra for for the Philadelphia thing. Aud okay. Audio is fine in both situations. So, uh, uh, referencing your argument on the. Um, saving uh, bandwidth from the networking po uh, point, you are uh, you are right. But uh, from the storing point of view, it's much uh, so it, it's very much to save. Uh, so if you have thousands of hours of recordings in broadcast quality, that that really counts. Okay, how we are? Thank you very much. Our next uh, presentation is about. Uh, enabling students to use uh, very expensive uh, uh, equipment for research in a virtualized way. 
It's going to be presented by Ignacio from University of Malaga. Uh, please. Good afternoon. I'm Ignacio Perez, employee of the University of Malaga. Um, welcome to Malaga. I hope you are fine here. Uh, I, please excuse me, this is my first presentation, also in English. Um, excuse me if you, if you don't understand me, okay? Uh, let's start uh, seeing the index. I'm going to talk about the definitions of a microscope, uh, the current situations and necessity of, of this tool, of this virtual microscope, the objective of this project, the architecture I have, I have used to, to do that, the uh, results, uh, more or less similar than the objective, a demo, and uh, future work. Let's start. What's a microscope? You can see in the image uh, several parts of a microscope, like uh, eyepiece, lens, observation tube, a lot of parts, several parts. But we don't need, we don't need this. We don't need it. Uh, we we have to, to build uh, a virtual microscope. Okay, it's it's more it's easier. It's easier than, than a real microscope. Let's continue. Current situation and necessity. In the current education system, uh, there is a teacher in front of all the students, uh, blah, blah, blah. The students are bored. Uh, it's so difficult to, to teach. It's so difficult to, to learn. It's a classical education system other ways to teach. We need other ways to teach. Uh, with uh, uh, small groups, with the students, uh, one microscope for each group, it's possible. But it's not always possible. It's very expensive. What's the solution? Obviously, virtuality is the solution. This is Terena. Uh, and what is a virtual microscope? It's a microscope full accessibility with single administration. Uh, every student can, can access it everywhere. And it, uh, this is allows to us uh, to integrate it in a, in a federated system. The students uh, can share the, the image. Um, in a, in a real microscope, you only have a set of images. If you want to, to see another image, uh, you have to move or to the other microscope and see the, the image of the uh, University of Cambridge. But in a federation system, you can see, you can share these images. Uh, why build another tool? Are we reinventing uh, the wheel? I don't think so. Uh, in, in other tools I, I have been seeing, uh, the students need a uh, half GB installed. Um, it's not always possible. Um, the problems with the versions between the client, vers the client Java, the server, okay? Um, Java is, is not open source. It's heavier. <coughs> I don't like Java. Another reason, uh, in other tools, the, the interface is, is not like a real microscope. It's like a, a Google Maps, okay? And the student uh, wants uh, a microscope, okay? They want uh, uh, different levels of magnifications. Uh, they want uh, wheels to, to move the image. They want a microscope. 
Also, we need uh, more features, uh, like uh, the possibility that the students can add uh, annotations. And, uh, uh, sorry, the student can add comments, and the teacher can answer it like a blog, okay? And also the teacher uh, can make uh, annotations and clarify uh, the different areas for the image. We are in, in improve the improving the, the real microscope, okay? And also uh, the teachers need that uh, this microscope uh, will be accessible, accessible for all the students in the university community. What's the objective? The objective is uh, that the students uh, have a set of, of images and uh, the student can select one, like, like an, uh, in a real microscope, select one image, put it in the, in the microscope. Okay? The student can see uh, image information like author, uh, description, the different magnification levels, uh, etc. Uh, uh, we need a mechanism to, to move this image vertical and horizontally, okay? like a real microscope. We need also um, a revolver the, with the different levels of, of magnification, magnification. Sorry, I, uh, we have improved the microscope with uh, annotations, mm, selecting different areas and, and putting them in, the, in different descriptions with the possibility of add comments of the image. Okay. Uh, it's make possible the, the interaction in the, in between the students and the teacher, <coughs> not in the class, in the house, okay? in, in their home. I, uh, I don't explain the uh, federated cases I'm saying barefully, okay? You know what is a, a federated system. Uh, Bob uh, wants to access uh, the microscope of the University of Malaga, but uh, uh, Bob needs to, to be, uh, need to have an account in this university. But Bob is the university, uh, from the University of Salamanca. Uh, Bob chose this ID provider, put his around, his user and password, and uh, can access it, okay? Federated system. Uh, this allows us um, the possibility to, um, to make different groups with, with different levels of, of permissions, uh, administrators, teachers, students, uh, editors, okay, only view, view only. Mm. We've implemented it uh, easily with a federated system. What's the architecture we have to use? Uh, pyramidal diff images, <coughs> what, uh, where the, each object has a, a lot of images, one per different um, magnification level of the microscope. The image of the top uh, smaller than the image in the in the bottom of this pyramid, and each uh, image are uh, divided in in squares, okay, like uh, like Google Maps, and the IIP server only send the the squares you can you can see, you might, you won't see. I, we have used a simple SAML, PHP, to make the federation possible. Uh, the programs are developed uh, using Django. It's a framework of Python, a very good framework. And uh, IIP server is the, 
the server uh, who send the DC images, okay? The client is in JavaScript using Mutools. And what's, what's the result? You won't see the results. Uh, I know it's not like a real microscope. Uh, we are working on it, okay? Um, let's go to, to see a demo. I must to choose the, the ID provider, the University of Malaga. This is not uh, the, the real, the real ID provider is only a, a demo. Okay, it's, it's the simple XAML PHP are uh, installed in my, in my own computer. The user and password is uh, the user and password I have in, the, in my account in the University of Malaga. Okay. Better. Uh, the student can select uh, the gallery, the match, uh, who you want to, to see. Sorry. I select the, the first one. You can see the, the author and the dates of created of modified. modified. <laughs> In the left of the, of the screen, uh, we can see the, the level of magnification, magnification levels. And it's like a, a real microscope. I only see uh, the current level, the current zoom level, and the previous and the next, like a revolver, okay? It's a compromise between realism and uh, usability. I choose realism. If I choose the 100 level, <coughs> we can see the image. We can move into the image. We can select uh, this small square and put it anywhere of the image. We can move in the image using the two wheels to move vertically and horizontally. And also, we can uh, select the notes that the teacher are, are adding to, to this image. And uh, we can see the highlighted area of this image. But, uh, it's a stranger, a stranger thought. I'm no scientific. I, know, I don't know what's the okay? description of the area. And also, uh, we can add uh, comments. Uh, Gregory House said, uh, what is um, Ignacio Pérez answer? I don't have no idea, okay? I'm no scientific. Um, I choose the second image, and you can see the same, okay? Different levels of magnification, similar that a real microscope. And you can choose a different area, nucleus, white area. It's a white area, I found it. And anymore. What's the future work? Uh, we need more realistic interface. Uh, I want to, to have a, a realistic interface with a circle, 
like when you are sitting in a microscope, but uh, I'm working in it, on it. Total freedom in selection areas, because uh, nowadays I only can select uh, the, the, the squares of the image. I don't, I can't, I must select the, the empty square. I haven't the, possibil the possibility to, to select uh, em half of, of these squares. You don't understand me? I think so. Allow the combination of images, we can um, uh, have two images in a, with an ultraviolet image and an optical image, and mix them, and uh, can choose the opacity of, of these images and with a slide, and uh, see more than one or the other. And we have to, to develop um, a friendly administration zone. Okay, the, the, the teachers are more comfortable. Thank you very much. And special thanks to uh, Antonia Gutierrez, who, uh, who allows this project possible and, and me to work in it. Feel free to, to make any question. Slowly, please. Thank you very much. Questions? Questions? You mentioned that the, the software you developed is public domain, so it's available for, uh, for anyone? National Gallery? The, the, the software is public, public dom domain, right? Can you repeat the question? <laughs> so the, the software is public domain, right? Yeah, Open source? Yeah, okay. We will be putting it in the Iris G Forge, okay, in Red Iris. Once it's uh, in a decent format to be public, we will put it in the Red Iris G Forge and it will be available for everyone. And, and, and who is able to, to upload pictures uh, into this ar archive? Is the teacher able to, to publish uh, his or, or her own pictures? Yes, they, we will allow teachers, to, but as they are very heavy images, we will allocate some process that you can come with a DVD or, because even doing it over the land, it's a big heavy process. So they are 900 meg and things like that. I have a DVD with just two of them. So there's not what well, we can do with our networks. So we are thinking about the way we can do that, but because doing that over the browser uh, times out and, and gives problems, we are trying to find a way that could be comfortable for the teachers to upload images. We, are, we have to test the process. Okay, thank you very much. Question, questions? Okay, then thank you, Ignacio, again. Jacqueline uh, has lost her bag. If anyone spots it, the one she carries, okay, Jacqueline Brown, the one she always is, she's always pulling. If I, anyone spots that blue bag with a stick coming out of yes, it, please, yeah. please notify anyone around in the organization. Thank you. Okay, or. Uh, Next presenter is, is uh, Rolf Brugger from uh, Switzerland, from Switch, another, another, another interesting Switch, Swiss project by Switch, uh, which is uh, about uh, a, a federated uh, e-learning object uh, um, repository. repository system. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Andras, for the introduction. Um, as Andras already said, I'm working for Switch. Switch is the NREN in Switzerland, 
And I'm working for Switch since two years, and this may be one of the reasons why this is my first TNC conference here. And I was very interested to see uh, what other entrants at other countries are doing. And I was a little bit surprised to see that, obviously, it's network, network, connectivity, all, I would say, the lower level. And uh, this, this was a little bit of a surprise to me because at Switch we are often having discussions whether in the long run, in the long term, network will really be that uh, important for, for the NRANs because it might very well become a commodity network, right? And uh, NRANs have to compete with, uh, with the market. And this is why Switch has started activities now to, to look for other business activities, which means identifying what is really needed by the universities, by the community, what is really specific for the universities in terms of services that cannot be found elsewhere. And uh, this is what I'm going to present to you. It's about uh, Switch Collection, the Swiss e-learning content exchange platform. So that was a lot of digression. Just in a few words, what is Switch Collection? It's a community repository to share all kinds of digital learning content for Swiss universities. I mean, with these four or five keywords, actually, the, the, it covers all of it. I'm going into a little bit more detail, of course. So what are the goals and the motivation of this repository, of this some kind of digital library? One very important part is reusing e-learning content. Why do we want to reuse? Of course, it is obvious. Developing uh, e-learning content can be extremely expensive. Um, I have been working in another project before I was hired at Switch, which was uh, developing um, top-notch high-level courses for universities, e-learning courses. And there we had prices, we had uh, costs of something around 10,000 euro per hour of e-learning courses of content. So you see, high level um, or high quality content can be extremely expensive. And of course, universities are, have high interest to uh, take more advantage of these developments and to share them that, so that they can be used at different contexts and locations. Another new aspect is open access to e-learning contents, open access for Research publications is, uh, is a hype topic currently. Nobody's really talking about e-learning, and uh, this is the reason why we would like to address this with this project too. Enhance collaboration between uh, universities, of course. It really makes no sense that universities do in the, uh, independently develop the same e-learning contents, right? It doesn't make sense. It makes sense to pull these resources together. Another important aspect to us is making teaching activities more visible. Teaching now at universities, you, you know it certainly very well. This is something which is usually hidden behind the doors. You cannot really see what is being taught, how the teacher teaches, and these kinds of things. This is not the same case with research. There usually, this is very well visible and you find it in the newspapers and whatever. Teaching is too much hidden and we would like um, to make it more visible to the public, to other students, to other teachers. And something quite new actually is having a possibility to make teaching activities also citable. This is also one of the, of the ideas that the Swiss community has to make teaching some kind of more interesting, also more rewarding, also, uh, always compared to research. Yeah, I think these are the most important goals, motivation. Finally, we would have uh, an increase of quality of education. Maybe I should point out you don't see that we do want to lower the costs. This is not really, uh, not really an aim. If we can, with the same costs, increase the quality and enhance collaboration, that would be great. So, such a repository, it can be uh, designed in many different ways. We have had to make a few general decisions about this project. First of all, 
what are restrictions or requirements that we are imposing. First of all, this repository or this repository federation, as you will see later, is currently only for learning objects. So we do not cover other kinds of documents or contents. We cover only Switzerland for now. It might be extended in the future, but for now it's only Switzerland, and it's only for higher education. On the other hand, we have deliberately decided to have no restriction or no con uh, constraints about the granularity of the objects. One object can be an entire course, or it can be a single image. So for instance, uh, an, uh, an, an object in it could be one of the microscope images that we have seen just in the presentation before. Or it can be a score module or whatever. We have also no restrictions or um, constraints about the usage license of the learning objects in it. Of course, the idea is open access, as I said before. And the idea is so to have a, a very open license like Creative Commons or, or the like. But it is also possible to upload and to distribute commercial courses which have been developed by the uh, higher education community. Then we do not have restriction about the access rights. Again, we would like to have public free access. Everybody can access to it. Um, but it is also uh, possible to restrict the access, either to the institution or to a group of users or even to individuals. This is sometimes important when copyright issues, uh, when we have copyright issues, which we have quite often, unfortunately. And finally, we do not have any formal quality criteria in this project. Um, the software is entirely based on open source software. It's on, based on Fedora Commons and on Lucene, which is the search engine. And as, uh, as protocol for exchange of data in our federation, which I will show you later on, we use uh, OAI PMH protocol. We initially were using the product uh, PKP Open Archives Harvester but we had some issues with it, and that's why we have developed our own harvester, which is called Harrow. And um, it will be available on SourceForge very soon, and if you are using um, OAI PMH, you might be very interested in this piece of software. It's really a cool piece of software that we have designed. It's not at all specific to our needs. It's a very generic uh, um, OAI PMH harvester, and it could very well um, be adapted to any other application, actually. So if you are using this, have a look at it and also give us feedback, please. So I was talking about federation. Um, as you have seen, we have, of course, one repository server that we are building. This is some kind of a database. And this is one centralized national database that all universities can use. But we do have universities in Switzerland who do already have their own repositories, their own content servers. And uh, this is not at all a problem, because what we would like to do is have a, a general, a generic possibility to access to all the contents of all the universities, whether it is one server or repository or not. This is really not important. So that's why we are um, putting them all together in a federation and we are guaranteeing that if you are uh, searching for content, that you will be directed to the correct server. I have another slide which um, is a bit, little bit more complete. So you see here the community repository, which is operated by Switch. The blue parts are operated by Switch, and the non-blue parts are operated by the universities. So we have the community repository server operated by Switch, and some institutional repositories. We put all these together um, using the Harvester component, as I was uh, just explaining, and we do have one common search index. And we do provide currently one, uh, uh, one search interface, a web-based search interface, where you can also download content. The protocol for this is OAI PMH, as I already said. And here we do have a REST protocol, which allows to attach virtually anything any uh, web application on top of the search index. Then I would like to point out this part here. How does content get into the community repository? 
Here again, we do have a REST interface and uh, we do provide an upload form or actually any other application could be uh, attached to this <laughs> repository over the REST interface. All right. Um, now I would like to go a little bit deeper into the concepts um, and talk about the folder concept that we have developed to, um, to organize right, um, access rights actually. So first, let, let's quickly have a look at how libraries are working. When content comes into the library, there is usually a, a quality assessment process, usually one person or a group of person who decides what kind of books, what kind of publications go into our library. So this is a centralized process. This is not the case here. This is highly distributed. It is user driven, this means virtually any teacher should be able to upload their contents. And, but we have, to, we have to rule these access rights. We don't want to have anybody who can uh, upload content anywhere. So this has to be organized. And we are organizing access rights, upload access rights and edit access rights with folders. And this is actually quite similar to um, access rights that you know from the Unix file system. We can design folders and then we delegate access rights to subfolders. So the top level um, of folders is organized by switch. And on request, for instance, University of Zurich might request to have a folder, might request to have access to this repository. Switch is creating a repository and gives the edit rights to the University of Zurich to one person. They usually would create subfolders and again delegate the access edit rights to, for instance, departments, and so on and so on. And what I have drawn here is what we currently have in our server. There is one project, Gender Studies Project, which within their projects are organizing themselves and are building um, their own subfolder structures according to their needs. So I've been talking a lot. I think I'll make a short demonstration right now just to give you an idea how it looks like. Do I have a browser? Right. Okay. So I go to uh, collection switch ch, and um, the idea of the interface is to keep it as simple as possible. We can search the repository here, or we can look at, we can browse through the repository. You have the possibility to browse either through the disciplines of the repository. So for instance, uh, humanities, and, and this, is, this is also hierarchical, so I, I can go down to social sciences. And uh, yeah, here we have a few contents in here. As we have started with this, uh, repository quite recently. It will be officially uh, launched in a few days. Um, we do not have a lot, of, um, a lot of documents or other content in it. We only have or we mainly have switch, switch uh, cast contents, video recordings that uh, have been made with switch cast. So for instance, uh, there has been a meeting about mobbing. Yeah, and you could have a look at this here. So this is actually switch cost. So this is one possibility to browse through the contents. The other possibility is through the folders. This is what, what I was just explaining before. And you can see we have uh, a few institutions who are already subscribed to this service and who are using it. And when I go to the University of Zurich, you see the philosophical department. There we have the gender studies project with a few documents in it. Yeah, right, here we have a few, few documents. When I choose one document, this is the way it is presented. I can download it here, and here is a few metadata which is displayed. I'll 
talk about uh, metadata uh, later, a little bit more. And um, of course, we have the possibility to search through the contents. Uh, for instance, equality. The gender study documents have a lot about uh, equality. The search actually works uh, over all the metadata and over all the content. It also searches in, in PDF contents and Word documents and anything. This is Lucene who does it. And uh, of course I can also, I can combine these. So before I have found 33 documents, and now I only find 12 documents where all the, um, the keywords are present. So this is, this is just a quick overview of uh, how you can search in this, in this repository. I would like to very quickly show you how content is uploaded because we have very much paid attention that it is as simple as possible for the end users. And this I'm not doing on the production server, but on our test server, because I don't want to interfere with the production server. You're right. Thanks. <laughs> so it looks similar. Um, when I want to upload content, I have to log in. And in Switzerland, we are lucky enough to have uh, Shibboleth authentication nationwide. All universities support it. This is really a great relief if you want to develop uh, to develop um, uh, so web applications. You don't have to deal with all the account management. This is really great. this so when I'm logged in I have uh, two new options I can add folders uh, I can manage my folders or I can add an object and I'll very quickly show you how this works I have an upload form which is very short I take my presentation I have no summary. I have to add a discipline. So I take this one. And I have to choose a folder where I have access or editing rights. And as you see, there is only very few folders where I actually do have edit rights. This is okay. Okay, I put it in here. And now here these are um, mandatory, other mandatory metadata fields. I have to say who is allowed to download this object. I make it public. Who is allowed to edit it? I say that it's only me. I could have as other uh, possibilities, I can define a group or I can, uh, I could specify that it's only at my institution, which is switch, that all people would be allowed to edit the content. And I have to add a license. We have some predefined licenses which are Creative Commons. This is very handy. Or you can define any other license. I may take this one. Now, I publish it. I should agree to the terms of conditions. <laughs> now this might take some time to upload it because it is a rather large document. But yes, when it's uploaded, what you see, it now you, you have the view of what we have seen before when I'm uh, looking for documents, when I'm searching for documents. And uh, if I would like to add more metadata, this is very easily done. So if you, I move around with the mouse, I can uh, actually very easily add other metadata fields. So that's for the demonstration. 
So this was the folder concept. Um, these were a, a few basic functionalities and um, we are going online with this version. This is version 1.0, so uh, really a, a basic feature set and we are of course thinking of, of new features that we would like to add in the future. And one feature is, there's, uh, yeah, one feature is that the possibility that folders can be associated to more than just one top folder. In particular, if you have the project Gender Studies, this is a joint project of several universities in Switzerland. And to reflect the responsibility for the contents in this folder, it should be possible to associate this folder to, to different universities. And this is what we would like to do um, with the possibility to have multiple associations. Luckily, the system below, Fedora Commons, uh, very easily allows this because uh, relations between folders, they are, uh, they are mapped and can be mapped very flexibly. So I said that I will be talking about metadata. The metadata model that we chose is Dublin Core and actually a subset of Dublin Core. And there's, as you see, only very few mandatory metadata required. This was a very important requirement of the Swiss universities. They said, please don't bother us with long forms that we have to fill in. And we will, anyway, we will fill in nonsense if it is too much. So you cannot really force people um, to, yeah, to have too much work with uploading content. This is why we decided to very limit the mandatory metadata fields as much as possible and hopefully people will later on add useful metadata later on. So mandatory metadata fields, you have seen it actually in the upload form before. And then there's a few optional uh, metadata fields which are available which are predefined by Dublin Core. Um, and other aspect which will be addressed in the future is integration of, of, this, uh, of this project, of this infrastructure, of this piece of infrastructure. Uh, unfortunately, a few pictures are missing, but it's not that much a problem. Um, one very important aspect is the possibility to search through the repository without having to type in uh, collection.switch.ch, but to provide to the users and to uh, developers of web applications, provide them the possibility that they can directly add search buttons into their environments. So for instance, this could be a website of a university, of a department with a search box and uh, this, this uh, would lead to search results directly displayed at their website. This search could also be, be uh, predefined in the, in the sense that um, it would only, uh, searching for content would only search in a defined subset. For instance, all documents of a specific department, but not at, in other documents, or not in other departments, or all documents of one professor or something like that. So some kind of a predefined search. Or of course, um, any application can embed browse and search functionalities through the REST interface that we are offering. How much time do I have left, Andrasis? Do I have to hurry? Okay, thanks. So what I just said, interfacing the repository engines with other applications is a very hot topic. And for instance, we have seen before the, the application of the interactive microscope. This would be a very nice uh, a very nice interaction, I think. This could be the interactive microscope with the nice um, with the nice web interface where students can zoom and go through these, these images while having the images in the repository engine shared by all universities. This would be a very nice uh, project, I think. And of course, yeah, any other integration as well is possible. As I said, we are just starting this service, but we had a rather long um, pilot phase already behind. This is why I can already talk about a few experiences that we had so far. And you have also seen the repository is not empty. There is content in it. So first experiences is 
what, what works well is that content being shared in well-defined work groups, as you have seen this gender study project where we have already established work groups, people who are already working together who know what they are talking about, who can distribute, um, who can distribute tasks. They, they really love this kind of environment because uh, yeah, they, they can very efficiently share their documents this way. Contributions which are related to defined projects. As I said before, I was working in a project with, called Swiss Virtual Campus where um, high quality content was developed. This kind of content which has been funded from, uh, from some specific sources, this can be easily updated and managed, uh, uh, uploaded and managed in, in uh, such a repository. And what also works well is automated ingest from attached applications. This could again be the micro um, scope application that we have seen before. So contents which are uploaded or which are used in there could directly go to the repository and vice versa. So when the user doesn't have to make a specific action. But will the system be used on on a, on, a, yeah, on, a re, on a regular basis by teachers, by, by, the, by, the, by the big mass of the, of the people at universities. This is actually an open question. And there is no doubt there are, I think, early adopters or people who are really interested in sharing. Maybe not much, not, not many, but there are a few of them who would be very happy to share all their, all their contents in such a repository. That's no question, I think this is clear. But if it will be possible at a large scale for the entire community, this is still an open question. And that's why uh, I have listed a few issues or a few challenges that we will have in the future. So one problem is that teachers say, I, I would happily share my courses, my content with other teachers, but I have copyrighted material in it. I have copyrighted images. And these copyright questions, they can really very, be very tricky for teachers. So this is an issue. Learning contents usually are considered by teachers to be their personal property. Although teachers have been paid to develop it, and I, I think it, we should consider this as a property of either the universities or, uh, or even public property. Teachers often consider this as their private property and they are not so happy to share it. Maybe also because we do not have business models around sharing content. And, well, this goes in the same direction, B missing business models, missing incentives. Um, people would have, yeah, actually there's no incentive to share content. They have additional work and there's no compensation for it. And we can observe that Currently, there is no culture established as in other areas where people are very happy to share their contents, like, for instance, uh, open source software, which is working very well, or on YouTube. Why are people sharing contents on YouTube? Or Wikipedia, which is really a lot of work also that people or, or experts are contributing their knowledge to the large public. So it is working here and it might be difficult to work um, in a context like these repositories that I was just talking about. And another aspect which is really interesting, I think, is to have a look at research. In research, it is working very well. The research community knows how to deal with contents, with high quality contents. They are very happy to share it, to distribute it. And I think it is worth having a look at this. Why is it working in research and why isn't it working yet in education? And um, I think this is not really directly related to the project that I should present here, Switch Collection, but I think it is worth having a look at it. And this is my last slide and I think I'm not going into the, too much into the details. Those who are interested can have a look at it later. But I have made a comparison between how, is content, how do you deal with content in research and how do you deal with it in education? 
How is it funded? How is quality assurance done and reusage and anything? And I think it really in the long run, we, we should reflect, we, we should think about how can maybe education also be more rewarding to teachers as it is now the case with, with research because it, it isn't the case right now. Although, officially, all the universities would say, we are here for doing research and education, same weight. In reality, it's not the case. Okay. Thank you very much for your interest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rolf. It was an inspiring talk, a uh, very useful service, and good luck with it. Mm -hmm. Now, questions? Um, I wonder about the process in developing this system. How was the, the universities involved? How did they participate in decisions? And also have like higher level management at the universities had any influence on this or made any decisions whether this should be used or not? I'm very happy for this question, thank you. Actually, this, um, this project, it started already a long time ago. It, I think it started about four years ago when um, when the, the rector's conference in Switzerland um, asked the question what kind of infrastructure, of additional infrastructure for e-learning would be needed in Switzerland. And this entire um, decision process was guided by SWITCH. So SWITCH has invited um, four work groups from the universities consisting of 32 people which came from the users, came from the libraries, which came from uh, the, uh, the IT departments, and they had to decide and to define what kind of infrastructure will be needed in the future. Initially, we thought that it will be another e-learning management system like Moodle, something like that, which is operated on a national level, but the outcome was indeed that universities would like this kind of infrastructure, a library allowing to share contents. So this was the first step. Uh, a definition of uh, what exactly would the universities need in, in the long run. Then SWITCH has started this project and we had a rather long pilot phase and during this pilot phase we had representatives from four institutions which continuously gave their input and told uh, and explained what exactly as kind of features they would uh, expect in this product. And finally there was a decision from the, uh, from the rector's conference in Switzerland that this kind of project should be supported. So it is actually top down and bottom up. It's both aspects which I think is really very important. So the rectors, they do believe that in the long run they will need a more efficient handling of content. And bottom up, of course, also teachers do have the problem, how do I get my contents? Other questions? Um, is, is there much management overhead in the, um, in the directory structure? Uh, is there you, much what overhead? Is there much management overhead? You, you have to set up directories for each of the universities, and then do they have to maintain the directory structure after that? You mean managing with this, this folder architecture? Yes, yes. No, I think there is really not much management overhead. Um, but uh, or, or are you asking this because why are we having a, f a federated or a delegated system? I mean, it, it could be centralized. It could be, we could centrally define this, this structure, but I think it is more efficient if we really delegate it and everybody can define its own way how documents are organized and all. But this is very easy and uh, I mean, I could have shown this here, uh, creating folders, managing them is not a big issue. The only aspect which is time consuming is define access rights. And usually what people would have to do is um, defining edit rights, they would have to define groups. And this group management, well, it's somewhat time consuming because usually you would, you would individually invite people to be part of that group. Other questions?
Then I have a question. How about URNs? So did you consider it, uh, using the URN technology? I know that you know, five to six years ago, there was a great hype around URN. So what yes. do you think? We are considering it. URN, DOI is another um, approach to have, um, to have this, the idea of, of URN, for those who don't know it, is to have persistent identifiers, persistent links that are really long lasting to-, to uh, Not to like contact. URLs. URN. Uh, Not like URLs. Not okay. like URLs, right, because URLs can disappear. It's, um, yeah, some kind of like ESBN, ISBN number for books, having such kind of an identifier. We are thinking of it, currently there is no uh, demand from the universities for it. But uh, it, it is perfectly possible to add it later to the, to the system. Okay, so if no other questions, then I'd like to uh, close this session. Thank you very much for participating. And uh, uh, I'd like to call your attention that the buses will la leave at uh, 8 a.m. Uh, from in front of the uh, Hotel Palacio, from the middle of the city, so uh, don't forget to be there. Thank you very much. Eight o'clock, yeah. <laughs>